Welcome to Sunlight. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to just encourage you to download the Sunlight app. Stick around to the end of the service so you can learn a little bit more how to do that. But for now, let's worship together. I'm wearing, sporting my sweater today, uh, not because we need it so much in South Florida, although recording day today uh, is a little chilly, but it's mostly solidarity with all of our friends up in the north. I know we got some of you up north that are uh, experiencing some severe winter storms, so uh, we're thinking of you down here in South Florida. All right, let's dive right in. We're going to talk about the call of the disciples, and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4. I'll put these passages up on the screen for you as well. Um, it says this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and they immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So we, we've been tracking throughout this series, uh, Jesus reliving the, the life, the journey of the Israelites in the Old Testament. Remember, we talked about Joseph the dreamer, the journey into Egypt, uh, the angry king going through the waters of Jordan, coming into the promised land. Uh, all of these pieces of reliving this the lives of the Israelites and the journey of the Israelites so that Jesus is tied to the Old Testament and God's plan, his redemptive plan throughout history. And we see it here again. It's not surprising that we see Jesus calling men to follow him because we see it in the Old Testament over and over again, the calls that came in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the call to Abraham, now called him to go to a new land, to leave behind his family and his home and go to a new place. The call of Noah, the call of Moses to go and, and speak to Pharaoh. A lot of times in the Old Testament, it's a specific call to do a certain task, to be obedient, to be faithful. Here in the New Testament, in the new covenant that God makes with his people, Jesus stands right before these men in the flesh. And he says, follow me. At this point, it's not to do something specific. It's just to follow me. And I think a lot of times I try to distance myself from that call that Jesus makes to the disciples in this moment. And I want to I wanna say, well, that was to them in a specific time and place, but does it really is it the same to me? Is it that same call? And I hope we see as we go through this passage and as we look at Luke and the call there to the disciples there, that we get a sense that it is to us. And we get more than a sense that we hear the call of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, stand before us and call us as well. Because ultimately what we see is that Jesus calls 12 disciples. Why 12? Well, we know that there in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, there was 12 tribes of Israel. And every time the people would look back in their history, they knew that the commands and the calls and the promises of God were to them because they could trace their lineage back to one of those 12 tribes of Israel. For us, we look back to those 12 disciples who instituted the new Israel, the church. They were the ones who inaugurated the church in this world. The kingdom of God on this earth was inaugurated by these 12 men so that every one of us could look back and trace our spiritual lineage. We have a spiritual ethnicity 
that supersedes any other ethnicity that we lay claim to or that's a part of who we are. We have a spiritual ethnicity that we trace directly back to those disciples. And as you read this passage and you hear that call of Jesus, it echoes through the centuries to us today to call us to follow him. But what does it mean to follow him? How do we do that? Well, I think immediately and most practically, think about people who are further down the road in their relationship with God than you are and pray about whether they might disciple you. Ask them, Can, will you disciple me? I look in my life and I look back to the relationships in my life and the, the people that jump to my mind first are my parents. They discipled me uh, growing up in their home. I remember watching my mom and dad pray. They would, uh, at a certain time in their life, it was regularly, they would go into our living room before bed at night and they would both get on their knees and pray. And so many other stories I could share, but they spoke volumes to me. Then in college, uh, there was a guy by the name of Warren Vincent. Uh, he, he just texted me the other day, said, praying for you. I haven't seen Warren in, in years. We called him Vinny. But he poured into me for two years. He discipled me. He taught me how to lead others to Christ, how to share the faith that I have, how to disciple those people. Even before I went to seminary, I learned far more from Vinny than I did about ministry and living the way Jesus Christ lived than I did in a lot of classes that I took. Then there were seminary professors and even Pastor Scott right now and Ron and Jewel and so many other people in my life that, that mentored me and discipled me. And I just I encourage you, find somebody who's further down the road than you are and talk to us here at Sunlight. We have a, a discipleship program we call 222 Disciple. And it's just, it's building relationship with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, meeting on a regular basis to grow deeper in what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to follow? Well, just one caution, because I know when we, we think about discipleship and, and this radical commitment, this follow me, and, and we see these disciples, they, they drop everything. They leave their father, they leave their career, and we think, oh my goodness, this is fanaticism. Right? It's like, uh, and we've seen a lot of bad fanaticism in our world. And religion, we tend to think of religion and commitment to religion on this continuum of, on the one end, it's a low commitment. There are a lot of people who just, you know, in name, they identify with a, a religion, but they really don't practice it. So they have a really low commitment to that religion. And on the other end of that continuum is this fanaticism, this overcommitment that leads to all kinds of bad stuff. And when it comes to religion, we have to be careful because fanaticism to a religion automatically is, is a legalism, right? We talked about this last week, a couple of weeks ago, throughout the series, we've been talking about legalism and the dangers of legalism. But the call of Jesus Christ is a call to a relationship. Legalism is about earning God's favor. And then fanaticism, when we become a fanatic to earning God's favor, we automatically look down on people who aren't fanatics like us. But in the call of Jesus Christ, we know from the gospel that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for our sin has set us free from legalism. That we can't earn God's favor, Jesus Christ has done, for, done that for us. So then his call comes to us as, as a, a way of showing our gratitude to him. It's, it's bound by a relationship. It's not a religion. It's not a legalism. It's a relationship. And then we, you know, we become obsessed with knowing the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we were designed for. We were designed to be in relationship with God. And then that fanaticism, that obsession brings out the best in us, not the worst in us, like a fanaticism to a religion or a, a legalistic way of living, but a fanaticism to a relationship that we were designed to have. Then we look at other people and we just, we want to bring them into that relationship. We don't look down on them as less. We know where we've come from and we want to bring other people along in following Jesus Christ. 
And to understand following and the radical commitment to follow Jesus, we have to understand a little bit of what it meant to be a disciple in Jesus' day. And just to quote one uh, Jewish rabbi, he said this, cover yourself with the dust of the rabbi's feet. He said, That's what it means to follow. We tend to think, you know, we have this distinction between believing and following. And in ancient times, there, there was no difference. There's no difference between believing and following. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you follow. And you follow him so radically that you get dusty with the, the dust that he stirs up by his feet because you're so committed to learn from what Jesus taught. That means a, a personal relationship with him through other people in your life, through a personal devotional life, through a connection to serve at the churches. All of these pieces of life, our spiritual lives, that help us get dusty with the feet uh, of our rabbi from following him. One story is told of watching a, a rabbi walk into a, a bathroom in Jerusalem and all of his disciples followed him into the bathroom because they didn't want to miss one thing from what he taught and how he lived his life. And that's our commitment to follow Jesus Christ. When he calls us to follow him as he does each and every one of us, uh, that's the level of commitment that we rise to as he calls us to follow him. I want to look at Luke chapter 5 for just a moment because Luke also, he gets into a little bit more detail in uh, the story here of calling the disciples. So let's look for a moment at the first part of Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 4. It says this, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, we will let down the nets. I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I love that statement by Peter. Because you say so, I will. B-Y-S-S-I-W, right? That's, that's Peter's response to Jesus. Now, nobody likes to uh, get advice on something that they feel they know pretty well already, right? Uh, you ever got advice on your parenting? I have through the years. I needed it, but I didn't like to hear it from people. I get advice as a pastor from people, and I don't always like to hear it. Most often I need to, but I don't always like to hear it. Even my four-year-old granddaughter were riding in the car the other day, and, and she's singing, Windy the Pooh, Windy the Pooh. And I said, Kaylin, I love your singing, and I love that song, but it's, it's actually Winnie the Pooh, not Windy the Pooh. And she looked at me through the rearview mirror when I, where I was watching her and said, No, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. It's Winnie, no D in there. She said, no, it's not. And I said, I'm 55 years old, and I know how to read. <laughs> right? I mean, this should be evidence enough. I'm 55, you're four, and I know how to read. And she said, no, you can't. <laughs> and I said, it's Winnie the Pooh. And I tried to sing the song with her. And she said, no, it's not. And I said, uh, she said, my mom told me it's Wendy the Pooh. And I said, shall we call your mom? And she thought for a minute and said, no. <laughs> Nobody likes to take advice, right? And so Peter, he's been fishing all day. He's a fisherman. He knows his business. And he knows that Jesus doesn't know the fishing business. He probably knows him well enough by now to think, this guy's a carpenter, right? He grew up with a carp uh, carpenter for a dad. That's the business he, he knows. He does not know fishing. And so he says to Jesus, this is not a good idea. We've been down this road. Oh, you know, we've been working hard. And then he pauses and says, because you say so, I will. 
Well, so often in life, when we hear God direct us or we get a, a notion and a, an idea of what God wants us to do, our response is, God, it's too hard. I, I've worked long enough. It's time for me to rest. Uh, I've done this too many times. I don't want to beat my head against this wall anymore. And why do we have to keep do going down this difficult road? And then hopefully we pause and we say, but because you say so, I will. B-Y-S-S-I-W, because you say so, I will. And then Peter responds this way. He gets this huge load of fish, so much that they can't contain it in two boats. Both boats are starting to sink. Some speculate whether Jesus was providing for Peter and the other disciples uh, that their families would have enough. Uh, to provide for their needs while they were following Jesus. I think that's a beautiful thought, but they just, they haul in so much. And Peter's response is this. This is in the next part of this passage. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me. Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore and let, left everything and followed him. Peter's immediate response is, Lord, go away from me. I'm not worthy. I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, but we talked about baptism and we talked about at the heart of baptism is repentance. And we said repentance is the key. It is the key that opens the door to the kingdom of God. Peter doesn't know that yet. He can't fully comprehend what's happening here, but he's just opened the door, right? He, he has demonstrated the one qualification that every disciple of Jesus Christ must have. He humbles himself. He repents. He says, Lord, you're holy. I'm sinful. I, you need to be away from me. But unknowingly, Peter, you know, that's the one thing that God wants to see from us. That's what Jesus longs to hear from us is that humility. And Je Jesus says to him, Peter, don't be afraid. Uh, I've got big plans for you. You're going to catch much more than fish. You're going to invite. You're going to bring people into the kingdom. And I love that. Now, one more thing, and this is uh, back to Matthew, uh, Matthew's version, uh, Matthew chapter 4, where we started. And there's this word that Matthew highlights in his gospel, and it's the word aphentes. You're going to learn a Greek word today, okay? Aphentes. And aphentes means let or leave. And when Jesus calls uh, Peter and Andrew, his brother, and then James and his brother John, we see how Matthew highlights they left their nets, they left their father, uh, and they immediately followed Jesus. And Matthew uses this word a number of times in the few chapters that we've already, already read leading up to this. Because a couple chapters earlier, uh, we talked about his baptism, and he comes up to John, and John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus says, Aphentes, let this be, let this happen to fulfill all righteousness. And when Jesus says, let this be Aphentes, John does it. He does exactly what Christ asks him to do. And then in the temptation of Jesus, when Jesus is uh, tempted by the evil one, at the end of that those three temptations, he says to, to the evil one, he says, Aphentes, leave me. And that's exactly what the devil does. He leaves him. And here, when Jesus says, follow me, come, follow me, uh, the disciples immediately, Aphentes, they leave. They let go. They let go of their careers. They let go of their security. They let go of their families. It makes a point of saying that James and John left their father. And these other men had families too that they, they left behind to follow Jesus. And at one point, Jesus says in another part of the Gospels, he says, 
unless a man hates his father and mother, he cannot follow me. And Jesus isn't talking about actively hating somebody. He's talking about comparisons. He's talking about hating by comparison. In other words, unless you're ready to commit yourself fully, the Old Testament says this way, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and body. Comparatively speaking, that means hating everything else. That means becoming so radically committed in our relationship with God that we leave everything else behind. Now, before we wrap up today, I just want you to ponder that calling that Jesus extended to his disciples. It, It is a radical call, and their response is a radical one. And I don't want you to miss that this call comes to each and every one of us. And it comes in different ways to different people. Most of the time, it's not an audible voice. It comes through other people. It comes through circumstances in our lives. I remember both the call to commitment to Jesus Christ when I was a young boy, and I remember the call at 17 to ministry. And the call that Jesus places on our lives at different times in our lives is a powerful one. And I just want you to ask before we leave today, have you heard that call? And if you haven't, is it because you've been avoiding that call? And if you've heard it, have you been obedient to that call? Have you been radically committed to get the dust of your master all over you because you're following him so closely? And I just want to encourage you, listen. Listen again for the call of Jesus Christ in your life. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's reckless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, oh God Your grace is enough Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along.
What a powerful message. As I said earlier, remember to download the Sunlight app. It's easy to do. All you need to do is go to Google Play or the App Store if it's an iOS, and all you have to do is type in Sunlight Church and click download. It's that easy to stay connected with our news, find sermons, you can even give right there in the app. As Christians, we're asked to respond to a giving God by giving of ourselves, which like I said, you can do right through the app. Also, you can stay connected to us by texting 772-277-7072. Let us know of any concerns or anything we can be praying for you about. Also, make us aware if you gave your life to Christ. We want to know about it and celebrate with you. And finally, I challenge you to subscribe and to share this video with one person this week as a digital missionary.